We are joined on this episode by an actor, by an artist, designer, and illustrator, by a delightful human being, by all accounts. You may have seen her in feature films such as Secret in Their Eyes, Rudderless, Richard Linkletter's Boyhood, and Paper Street Pictures Horror Comedy Anthology Scare Package, which is now streaming on Shutter and will be available on Blu-ray October 20th. She is Zoe Graham. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you so much. What a nice intro. I like want that to be on my tombstone. All including the shutter part, all of it. <laughs> We'll talk later. I'll update the website for you. I'll just put this blurb in. <laughs> but yes, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. We're going to uh, chat with you a little bit about your career and some of the film roles and then Set Advocate, which we'll get into here shortly. But we usually begin by asking our guests how they broke into their respective fields. And with you, I believe it was art first. So assuming, you know, the love of art did come first. Well, was there an impetus that like really triggered that love or a particular painting or an artist that maybe sparked the interest for you when you were younger? Yeah, sure. Well, everything kind of is all intertwined. Um, and I was definitely interested in art first. I never wanted to be an actor as a kid, even though I, I loved movies and loved TV. My, I have a family that is, you know, when I was little, they worked in advertising. So my dad works as a director DP and my mom was working as a writer at the time. And um, they were all like, oh, you do not want to be an actor. Like out of the two children that they had, I have an older brother and they put him in some commercial. And with me, they were like, it's just not for you. Like, don't do it. But uh, so I definitely focused on art early on. And, and I was really lucky to grow up in a pretty liberal Austin household that, you know, fully saw that as an appropriate career. And And I had a dad that was like, you should be an architect. You should be a painter you should be you know any any lofty dream that was also artistic he was like very game for so i had that background growing up and and then i ended up in high school i i was in a band and it was it was an all girl band and at one point one of the uh our, our drummer sienna who's one of my very close friends still to this day uh said hey there's this this film crew that's they're they're casting for some documentary about cool lost in teenagers and like we're cool lost in teenagers uh, this will be great they, we thought like we're a, an all girl band we're in and then they you know we we got interviewed by them in her backyard and and it ended up being it was sort of like a a secret casting call for a, a Spike Jones project with Arcade Fire and um that's how I got cast in my first project was sort of you know I thought I was going in to be a cool Austin documentary teen and and then I got uh snatched up into the world of acting wow that is so cool I'm and like it, you were in a band <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very funny to me because like if I was hearing this from anyone else, I'd be like, that's so rad, like an all girl band and like. But for me, it's like I'm remembering myself as a 14 year old, and I'm like, I don't want to look at pictures of myself playing guitar oh. as a 14 year old. Like that that's the worst time of everyone's life. So yeah, it's a little bit of both. Of course, I mean this is my specialty is talking <laughs> no, about I'm these awkward years. I'm you having a awkward. field day. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, did you have like? A type of confidence that was going into like when you were playing music was a part of your personality coming out. Do you think like how was that? I wish you could see my face right now because I'm like, absolutely <laughs> not. Are you kidding? <laughs> um, I I loved playing music with my friends. But even more than that, I loved having friends that like we had to hang out every week to practice music. And like we had an activity to do so I didn't have to talk the whole time. And being up on stage, it did not feel natural to me at all. I feel like I had really shaky hands all the time. Um, but it was it was worth it to have this like non high school activity, you know, like I feel like the only way that high school was manageable for me was that I was like doing acting projects on the side and then also being in this band. And then, you know, I would kind of I felt like I was kind of like living a double life as a high school student during the day. So you weren't necessarily doing it for the performative aspect. It was really just like a survival slash social <laughs> coping thing. Yeah, absolutely. I also think it was, again, it was like valued by my family, like public artistic pursuits were, were definitely highly valued by my family. That's awesome. So even acting, uh, starting young with the acting, you ended up going to art school, correct, for college? And like that I still did. was the main pursuit? Yeah, which again, like a couple of people were a little bit intrigued by like, so you're going to be in these movies and not go try to capitalize on that right now? And I was like, it's fine. Like, it'll be there as as an 18 year old who has no idea how the industry is like. <laughs> um, but I'm so glad I did that because I 
That's so much. I, you know, I was born and raised in Austin. I never left, you know, besides vacations, I never traveled. I never, you know, I didn't, when I went to, I went to school in Baltimore and I didn't even visit the college before I went there. So it was a huge adjustment for me and, and one that I think I really needed. So I was really happy that I did that. Plus, that's some real life experience for, you know, to inform the acting as well. Totally. Absolutely. And I think it was a plus to not have everything riding on acting. You know, like when I w- would go into meetings, I had things to talk about other than like, I've been in five auditions today and, and here I am. I'd be like, yeah, I have a, a weaving due for my fibers class. And they'd be like, what a an enchanting, young, weird child. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that worked out for me. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of art do you do? Like, I've seen some of your illustrations, but what kind of art do you love to do the most? Yeah, I, I, um, I do a lot of, in like my personal for myself work, a lot of fibers based things in terms of like weaving, crocheting, knitting sewing and a lot of different forms that that can take on. But honestly, like it just comes in waves of wanting to work on that or work on something else. And now that I'm not doing it for a grade, you know, I I do, I'm not really making art for money or for a grade anymore. It's more about design for me these days, Uh, just trying to fit in, you know, fun illustrations when I can, when I'm doing uh, design work. I love your illustrations. I, I'm, we're friends on Facebook and I'm just like, oh my God, I wish I could draw like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, yeah. it's funny. Uh, going to art school will really humble you with your, for your drawing abilities. Cause there are kids who come in and they're like, drawing is what they do. They can like really, uh, look at something and then reproduce it in a photographic way. Uh, so hearing somebody be like, wow, you're so good at drawing it, like really <laughs> helps my ego. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm here to reaffirm you are really good at drawing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And if you ever have spare time to make me a hat out of crochet, I'm always my head is always here for you. Oh, I'm in. Winter is coming. <laughs> so leaving Baltimore, was it always the, the plan to move straight back to Austin? Or did you think acting still something you're going to pursue in Austin? Or was there a greater plan coming home? Uh, it was something that was vaguely talked about of like, should I move to LA? Should I move back to Austin? And um, I spent like a very small amount of time in LA during college and then right after. And it it just didn't feel exactly right for me then. I think I had a lot of growing up still to do. And I, you know, again, I like didn't know how to talk to a stranger and make a friend. So, you know, maybe, maybe it's in my future, but it, it wasn't right for me then. So, so Austin was the spot. I want to transition into talking about the film Boyhood. And you played an early girlfriend of Eller Coltrane's character. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen from that movie, which I mean, I saw as soon as it came out and it was brilliant. I mean, the fact that they filmed that over 10 years is insane and just prolific. But it seems as if you were able to bring a bit of yourself to that character because like you've been sharing, you went to school for art and you're very into illustration, graphic design and crocheting and stuff. You were able to bring that a little bit to your character as well. Can you tell us about that? Totally. So I have gotten extremely lucky with the directors I've gotten to work with because the vast majority of them, you know, want to take on like a super collaborative way of working with their actors and with their crew people and working with Rick and Eller. I, I was on that set for three years, which sounds like I was on it forever, but it was like a couple of days each year. And I never really knew if I was coming back or not, like, cause there wasn't a script that was fully laid out. So I was like, are we still together? Is this working? Um, but I would come in, we always shot in the fall and, um, they would kind of say, okay, here's what we're thinking for this year. We're going to, you guys are going to take a trip to Austin. You're going to talk about technology and, and this is our like rough script for it. And then me and Eller would, would run the script and kind of ad lib a little bit. And, you know, like if there was slang that was of that year, we'd kind of like say like, I wouldn't really say that anymore. Or like, oh, I would say it like this. And I think that's like a huge part of how that movie is really successful is like, the, the language belongs to the people who, who are speaking it. Yeah. I mean, just the opening shot of his daughter singing, was it Britney Spears? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite. Uh, also, you're on first name. You called him Rick. Oh, my God. I like that? <laughs> I loved it. I'm like, I have goosebumps over here. Richard Linkletter feels so formal to me because he's like the coolest, um, most like easy to talk to guy. And it feels almost like I'm like name dropping if I don't just say Rick. But then when I'm like, oh, Richard Link, you know, like either one, you're in trouble. 
neither one. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just like, that is so cool to hear that you were able to collaborate with your, you know, as far as language and, and bringing yourself to that part. That's so refreshing to hear that a big director like him is willing to listen to an actor. Not only that, but a 15 year old female. I, the kind of mind melding wizardry he had to do to get this like very anxious 15 year old girl who had hardly ever acted before to be comfortable enough on set to be like, I wouldn't say that word. Um, I don't know how he did it. I, I wish I could like be a fly on the wall as an adult and see kind of, you know, how he was, you know, the things that he was doing to, to make sure everybody was comfortable because I think that's really beautiful. But at the time I was just sort of like, let myself be swept up in it. That's awesome. How did you go about landing that role? Well, I auditioned for it. And uh, I think I believe that Eller was in the first uh, audition for it. And and I got to read just with him, which was really cool, just because it was like, oh, this is another kid. Um, And it was a real feel for, you know, what those scenes would be like. And yeah, yeah, it, it fit together from there. Did that have something to do or anything at all to do with you having an appearance in Slacker 2011? I know he didn't necessarily have anything to do with it production-wise, but I imagine he saw it, and uh, you did have a, a bit in that. Or was that just a happenstance from being just in Austin? Because Boyhood was shot sequentially, I started on Boyhood before I got cast in Slacker 2011. But uh, I think that Rick had already, I don't know that he had seen uh, Scenes from the Suburbs, which was the first project that I worked on. I, I'm not sure if he had seen that, but he had come to the set just to visit Spike and say hi. And uh, kind of, again, was like a very anxious person. I was like, hi, Mr. Rolling Clatter. Um, and then, you know, once I got cast on Boyhood, I was like, do you remember me being really awkward on that set and like saying hi? And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think we had kind of, he, he was aware of my existence from that. And then uh, Slacker 2011 was aware of my existence from being cast in Boyhood, even though it wasn't. Oh, gosh, gotcha. those are actually reversed. Yeah, yeah. I just think one of the things that I love so much about you and y- your style is that, and probably, I mean, I imagine this is exactly what Spike Jones and Richard Linklater saw in you, is that you weren't this polished, like, child actor. Like, you are a real <laughs> person and you bring that realness to your acting and it's just so refreshing and like unexpected to see as well so that's just one of my favorite things about you for sure thank you so much i really appreciate that i um that has like sometimes served me well and sometimes uh it hasn't so i I appreciate you saying that yeah for sure I'm sorry to hear that it sometimes hasn't served you well, but yeah, I, I second yeah. what Kelsey said very much. But <laughs> Well, that's that, right. Like there's a, a time and a place for every attitude and style of acting. So someone who was like really, really great at, for example, like Disney style acting probably wouldn't crush it in a Linklater movie, you know, like, or maybe they would. Who knows? No, fair enough. <laughs> um, so, you know, yeah, you win some, you lose some. In my opinion, you're winning all the right ones. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please don't go Disney on us. <laughs> I couldn't if I if I wanted to. <laughs> uh, Paper Street's doing what they can to make sure she goes the opposite direction because <laughs> you do uh, also appear, and I think we're past the spoiler window to say this is a. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll correct myself. You appear as one of the final girls alongside Josephine McAdam and Kelsey Probilski in Scare Package's final segment, and uh, I believe you did say that was your first foray into the horror genre. Yeah. It was, yeah. And were you happy to be uh, just covered in blood for days upon days? I was so thrilled. Honestly, I that sounds a little bit silly, but I'm a huge practical effects fan. So when I found out that, that Paper Sheet was doing like pretty much all practical effects for Horror Hypothesis, I was so stoked. And I was like, I have to be on this. A couple, I'm, this is the one that like, to me, doesn't give anything away, but like someone is thrown through a wall and they're like, yeah, we're going to do that. It's totally fine. And getting to, <laughs> then people knew that I was into that on set. So they'd be like, yeah, we're going to throw someone through a wall. And I'd like run over to watch it. Um, So it was awesome. It was really cool. Yeah, that set was gnarly. <laughs> gnarly. It was absolutely I- gnarly. Yeah, I was there for, I think, for only like a day, but the just walking through, it was filmed in an abandoned hospital and it was so creepy without everything going (laughs) on. And then Paper Street just turned that volume up times a thousand. It was so scary. Yeah, true. With no set dressing, it was already grimy and creepy. And Fear the Walking Dead used that for many, many episodes. And yeah, we just added lots of extra blood. I did some exploring in the hospital when I wasn't um, needed on set. So I could kind of go and see old Fear the Walking Dead sets. And that was horrifying. Being like, we weren't even here, but it looks like this. It was very scary. 
Yeah, it looks like what I imagine um, downtown LA to look like right now. <laughs> okay, we're fine. We're fine over here. Does Skid Row kind yeah, of look like that? I'm not going to say it does or doesn't, but uh, don't believe the media. LA is not poly weird. It's not accessible. It's just like everywhere you're from. It's uh, <laughs> a lot better looking people and better drugs in most of your cases. <laughs> Not Austin. Austin is uh, can go to it for that in a lot of ways, but <laughs> talking to the guy in Iowa right now, like, don't judge me. We got a lot more going on than you do. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm most excited to talk to you about, and I am thrilled that something like this is being started, especially in our film community here, is you have started up a consultation service that is going to help promote safer and more communicative and open onset work environments. And it's called Set Advocate. And I would love for you to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so Set Advocate is my baby. First of all, it's my COVID baby because I uh, COVID really gave me the chance to kind of step back and think about what I was really interested in right now and, and what I wanted to learn more about. And it you know, obviously COVID is not a good thing. I would prefer it if COVID did not happen. However, it gave me a chance to kind of take a breath and um, and learn about a couple of things and, and figure out why I was interested in them. And I, I started doing a lot of research about intimacy coordination, for one, which um, I kind of imagine that you guys know what that is, but just to let everyone at home know, uh, an intimacy coordinator is, is someone who comes onto a set as like a, a fight choreographer, but for scenes that involve intimacy. So that can be anywhere from kissing to a sex scene to a scene of sexual assault. And uh, they really help the directors talk with the actors and the actors make choices that are, are respectful to the other actors in it. Because for a really long time, the situation has been like, well, you know, we have this scene of sexual assault. So do what feels natural, which is to me like the most horrible thing you could say to an actor who's supposed to be um, representing a character who is, is committing a sexual assault because, of course, that ideally would not feel natural to them. And, and so having someone on set to walk people through that and have those conversations about uh, people's boundaries and, and what's comfortable and, and exactly which actions they're going to choreograph and, and repeat over and over again so that nobody's feeling anything unexpected. I got so interested in that, and but set advocate is a little bit more... Um, one size fits all for indie filmmakers. And uh, it has a lot of those same conversations, but just in general about being on a movie set. Uh, there are a lot of films that I got to be on as a younger adult, you know, from 14 to 18, where uh, I, I got really, really lucky where everyone on set was super supportive and, and really, really affirming of where I was on the set. But it could really easily have turned dark just because of the way that movie sets are set up those, you know, those communities. Yeah, I think that this is something that is so important and so necessary. And I myself just being in the indie film community here, based off of just, you know, budgetary limits, a lot of things like that are overlooked as far as, you know, keeping open communication. And I have definitely been put into some very uncomfortable compromising positions. And it's so scary. And also, you don't feel like you can speak up for yourself because a lot of the time in our industry, as a woman speaking up in any way, you're considered a diva, especially if you're considered to be the quote unquote talent on set. You know, a lot of the times they're like, OK, well, you know, she just wants this X, Y and Z. But I mean, there's definitely been situations where I've felt like I've been emotionally manipulated and scenes like that have not been handled correctly. And I mean, from here on out. I am going to push hard for your set advocacy to be something that is on set because I just I really feel like it's something that is so needed and so important to help everybody feel safe. And honestly, what's the harm in doing it? You know, thank you so much. It um, really breaks my heart to hear that you've had those experiences. It doesn't surprise me. Um, but knowing what that feels like also as as an actor, as a woman, it feels so <laughs> It, it doesn't have to be some really, you know, sort of dramatic, big, illegal thing that happens. It can be so something so much smaller and something that was not intentional. You know, uh, things happen on director's sets where I have friends who are directors who have the best intentions and they are, you know, they want everyone to feel absolutely comfortable on their set. But, you know, they also have a job to do, you know, like they're really busy directing and if an actor is having an uncomfortable situation and they're like, well, I don't really want to bother them. I don't really know if this is important enough. 
that's where this position would come in because there would be a set a specific person to not just report things to, but also just to go talk something over and be like, is this a big deal? Is this normal? You know, like, am I crazy for for feeling like this? I, I think it would be really helpful to have a specific person on set who didn't who wasn't also, you know, I, th- I think for the most part, we treat the makeup team as emotional support, which is so completely unfair, because they have yeah. super important jobs to do. And they can't, you know, I've gotten so much emotional support from makeup and costume teams over the years. However, that's not what they're being paid to do. And like they have jobs that are just as important as everyone else and and they can't be responsible for that as well. So that's where having a set advocate would come in. I absolutely agree. I do think that a lot of the time, unfortunately, they are the dumping ground as far as emotions go. Um, But yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head where you said that a lot of the time you don't know if it's necessarily as important of an issue to be able to bring up to the director because they have so much going on. But in your gut, you know, your gut is your gut for a reason and it, it, it tells you things. And um, I just, I think it's so great that you've come up with a system that it helps people feel safe and like not dramatic and not a big deal. Like, it's just like, Hey, I'm feeling a certain way. You know, I, yeah. I think that's just great. Well, there's so many instances I've had on movie sets where I'm like, I don't want to get this person in trouble. You know, like this yes. person said something to me or I saw them say something and I don't want them to be fired. And I'm so worried that if I tell someone while this set is still going on, they're going to be fired or they're going to, you know, some kind of punitive, embarrassing action is going to be taken that I didn't mean. So I think it's really important to have somebody who's like, sole job is just to listen to what the person wants, who's in the uncomfortable situation. And I feel like the vast majority of the time, it's going to be like, can you just talk to this person like one on one and and then we never have to talk about it again and I can just do my job and they can just do their job. And I think like so many things will be headed off at the pass. And and hopefully, um, ideally, it would be a, a pro for having uh, less lawsuits that come out after being on movie sets and also just like getting the best work out of people, people who are comfortable and feel supported are are going to produce better work. Absolutely. I 100 percent agree with that for sure. Uh, and can you tell us the exact website for that again? Yeah, I'm at setadvocate.com, which is S-E-T-A-D-V-O-C-A-T-E dot com. Set Advocate. Perfect. And I'm staying quiet for obvious reasons because <laughs> I'm trying to set an example for other men to just listen and not to necessarily try to jump in and tell anybody they'd be wrong about this because that's also a form of gaslighting. But yeah, as a privileged person on a set, I don't have that fear that reporting somebody for something would cost me my own people turning on me or, you know, worry about that stuff the way like a female on set might worry about that. So yeah, it's a, it's very important. And I, you kind of make the point of why it's so necessary because it's not fair to hair and makeup or costume or whoever you might bond with closely privately on a set to dump any of that on them. But uh, we do appreciate that they always listen. <laughs> totally, absolutely. <laughs> but I- yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of proving the point that like there needs to be an, you know, objective third party that's not tied to the director or the producer that maybe comes in almost like a SAG rep would or like a fire marshal or any other thing you would need for a specific type of piece of a, a movie. Sure. And and I think I, I so appreciate you saying like, I'm sort of staying quiet in this. But uh, I think another piece of it is just like where you come in in the process. Like if you're an actor who's coming on for three days on a shoot that's there for two weeks and, and you know, the producer knows the vast majority of the people who got hired on that not maybe not personally but they know who's there and their connection to the director and like who's friends with who and if you're an actor coming on for one day regardless of your gender you have no idea who's friends with who and like if I get this guy in trouble am I am I in trouble because I don't really know so there's there's like a lot of different power structures that are going on there and and a lot of them to me have honestly have nothing to do with gender it's just about you know the way that you were hired or um the specific role that you're playing on on set i think there are another really great reason to have a set advocate is so that if you were a male actor who felt like someone on set was putting you in an uncomfortable position you wouldn't have to um have that sort of talk about like what is it going to look like if i complain about this attention you know like it's complicated for for anyone who's who's made uncomfortable on a movie set. 
No, of course not. I certainly wasn't trying to make it a binary or a gender-based no. issue so much as just saying that I know I'm quite aware that I don't have some of the same concerns when it comes to just beyond filmmaking. You know, we, we can yeah. talk about jogging at night and walking down the street and other things that you guys might have to worry about that I, I fortunately, as a six foot three <laughs> giant man, don't have to. And like, I wish more yeah. people would be aware, more males I know would be aware that like yeah. you've got it made easier than you realize. But yeah, this is a very worthy cause, and we were happy to promote it on the show. Like, uh, it's something we're going to do our best to kind of implement as well going forward, just based on, you know, working with you and knowing how important it is to like, and again, Kelsey mentions it. I don't think we'd have a woman on the show that's been on a film set that doesn't have a story. Unfortunately, that's really the truth of it or multiple stories. So oh, yeah, yeah. it's, it's proving why it's a very necessary piece of the puzzle. I think going forward. Yeah. And again, ranging from truly horrible and could involve legal action to just something that just like, happened and now I don't want to come back to work the next day you know like it, it can be anything and I feel like the way that the film community is set up but specifically the indie film community is like you know we create these very short-lived it's like seeing a circus roll into town and like uh, nothing is in a parking lot one day and then there's like a giant circus there and you love being part of it and it's like really exciting and then two weeks later the circus is entirely gone and there's a, an empty parking lot and there's like no way to be like wait this weird thing happened but this is already over so i think we do need like very specific extra protection in those situations yeah definitely I very much agreed are we ready for some rapid fire <laughs> <laughs> um again that is setadvocate.com and you can find that link in the show notes at paperstreetpodcast.com we will uh, move into the next half of this, which is uh, if Zoe, if you're familiar with Inside the Actor Studio, we do a kind of similar Prowse questionnaire that we attempt to cater to what we know about you and some of your tastes and stuff. And I, I know you said you've heard at least one before, so you know the, the craziness you're about to get into. And again, like we tell every guest, no pressure. I promise it's not a, a hipster test. It's not a cool test. It's just first thing that comes to mind. doesn't have to be single answer. doesn't have to be 50 answers. Just don't stress over it. Okay. This never works. We tell people this. It never works. I'm <laughs> only going to be stressed in like five minutes. Don't no, worry. You're okay. Uh, Kelsey can start us off here. Cool. Oh, man. My answer is not good to this. But what, what movie do you think you have seen the most in your life? Hmm. It would definitely be a childhood movie because I don't I don't rewatch movies a ton as an adult. Um, like, since I grew up in Austin, it might be Spy Kids 2. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not even Spy Kids 1. I was really into the, like, tiny animals in Spy Kids 2, so that was a major watch for our family. Um, but also, oh, what else did we watch? We did a lot of Star Wars, but I was kind of, that was sort of like my brother's movie pick. So I, I uh, was sort of, like, anti that as a child because I wanted to be the one to choose it. But maybe The Breakfast Club. I was really into The Breakfast Club in, like, middle school oh, yeah. era. Yeah, maybe the Breakfast Club would would win out over Spike Kids too. I don't know. Spike I like Spike Kids too. Yeah, I love <laughs> that. Would have never come to my brain. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to think of like any any adult movie that would be like that, like any comfort movies for me. Well, <laughs> it's funny. My follow up question was: if it's not the same answer as above, what is your ultimate comfort movie? Like your warm blanket, your anytime, anywhere, like you could watch it forever. Is it The Breakfast Club or is it something else? It is not. My absolute favorite comfort movie is Ratatouille. I love this movie so much. I'm I'm very into food movies in general, um, but Ratatouille, I think, really, really takes the cake. I'm loving your answers. <laughs> um, <laughs> it sounds like the answers of like a 12-year-old, but I'm sticking it's by amazing. it. It's amazing. It's <laughs> amazing. Um, okay, so besides your own, what is one of your favorite acting performances that you have seen? <laughs> besides my own. <laughs> Let me think. God. I love um, the acting in the movie Big Night, speaking of food movies, is incredible across the board. I, I love um, Stanley Tucci in anything. I think he's an incredible oh, yeah. actor. Um, yeah. I'm sure I'll think of like five really amazing people in a second but that's that's where i'm going for now that is a pull i haven't thought about the movie big night in years oh man watch it uh last i should year, rewatch it it's so good and uh last year for my birthday my boyfriend and i made a timpano which is that that big pasta like almost like a cake thing that they make in it and yeah. it was very strange looking but delicious true to you loving food movies i, I believe you absolutely <laughs> <laughs> how about 
who is the one working actor out there that you have not had the chance to work with, but might be at the top of your list that you would work with in a heartbeat? So many, so many. Um, but I would really love to work. There's a lot of comedic actors I would really love to work with, but I don't, you know, when I've worked with super talented comedic actors before, I kind of end up just like dazzled by them and get my mind is taken off my own acting. Um, so God, who would I work with? This is perhaps a strange answer, but I would like to meet and work with Ellen Page. Now that Ellen Page is kind of into like activist stuff, I think it would be cool yeah. to hang out with her on set. And I think our our um, our sense of humor would align. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. Ellen Page, man. And just like looking at her, I want to put her in my pocket. <laughs> uh, Duna was definitely a huge deal for me because I saw it when I was, you know, exactly 13, exactly the right age to be like, I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, and so that it would be it would be really cool to see somebody who I really idolized and get to work with them. Yeah. Uh, what type of character that you is there one type of character that you haven't had the chance to play yet, but you really want to delve into? Yeah, I, I would like a, I feel like I can sometimes walk the line between being like the straight man in a funny movie or the funny person in a dramatic movie. Um, not necessarily like slapsticky, but just like sassy or ha- has a little bit of um sardonic humor and i would like to lean more into that just in, in terms of um instead of sort of playing you know i've i've gotten to play a lot of sassy girlfriends and i i would like to play like a sassy best friend you know i would love to do a, a movie where the main character was a woman and doesn't even necessarily have to be me um mm. and just like get to have more scenes with ladies that'd be cool yeah. yeah I, well, I mean, this is off the map. I would also like to be in a Western where I get to ride a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Just two very different. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of both. <laughs> do you do you know how to ride a horse? I did when I was little. I wasn't a full horse girl, but I could really get back into that if I uh, got the chance to. I was going to picture you as like, I love how you were like, I wasn't a horse girl because we all know what the horse girl <laughs> was. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't, I, I was like really interested in horses up to the point where it was like, to be more serious about this, you have to have a horse. And my parents were like, oh, we don't know. That's not our, our thing. Um, so that was the end of my horse girl potential. Kelsey, fellow Texan, did you ride a horse when you were young as well? Is it part of a rite of passage there? Oh, God. Uh, I think when I had to, I, I grew up Catholic, so there's something called confirmation where you're, you're not a real Catholic until you're confirmed. And, uh, we went to confirmation camp out in the middle of nowhere and I had to ride a horse then. <laughs> I think that's not excited. I was like thrilled. Like that was the best part of the whole part of being Catholic. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> was that one experience that I got? Um, I think I've done it maybe another time. I would love to get into horse riding, truly. And I, also you get to wear cool pants. Totally. I never I never had the cool pants because I would just do it like at summer camps. Um, but I uh, have sort of, set, I think maybe as a teenager, I did a, a trail ride or something with someone after like not getting to do it. And I was like, this is not even fun. This is just like, feels torturous to this horse to be adding extra weight to its very long walk. Um, it was a lot more fun when you get to like actually like jump over stuff and all that. Yeah, I get that for sure. <laughs> this isn't fun for this horse. No, no, not that the jumping necessarily would be, but it just feels like laborious. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> uh, next up, speaking of horses and horse whispering, you're an avid reader, even putting your Twitter feed to use by kind of logging what you've read, I've noticed. Do you have a favorite novel, fiction or nonfiction, or maybe a favorite author? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Let me, I'm going to turn around and look at my bookshelf and see what I've got. Um, the Princess Bride was like the first book that I thought was like for adults that I, I read and really loved. Um, and I like that sort of like a comfort book for me. I just organized all my books and realized that I had two copies of it. And I was like, I don't even know how this happened. Um, I really love speaking of, again, speaking of sort of westerny prairie, uh, things. I love the book, Oh Pioneers. I think that's a great book, uh, which is by Willa Cather. Is it Cather? I've never said that name out loud, even though I love that book. And I could really go on. I think maybe Ann Patchett's my favorite author. 
but oh, I could go on for an hour. I could just keep going if you want me to just name books. It would be a really interesting podcast for everybody. <laughs> I vote yes. Uh, I mean, I'd be amused by it, but no, not the listeners might not. Speak for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, what is your all-time favorite board game? Oh my god, thank you so much for this question. You're you're hinting at the fact that I love board games and am that horrible person who's going to be like, can we, you you guys want to get together for a board game? And COVID's really been cramping my style there. Um, I I love a lot of board games. Um, Again, I like want to take you guys over to my shelf and see what I have. (laughs) Anything but Monopoly. I would have wanted a video podcast more than uh, Zoe's house tour. Yeah, yeah, like I'll give you a board game tour. Um, Please give me. Yeah, Monopoly is not my game because my, my older brother always whooped my ass at it when I was little, so I was a bad sport and never wanted to play. Anyone who says that's their favorite's a sociopath, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think my all-time favorite is maybe Splendor, the game Splendor. But Code Names is also great in terms of like sort of a party game if you're sort of forcing people to play a board game and they don't really want to. Code Names is a good choice. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I do really love Splendor. And anyone who's like a, a real hardcore board game fan is yelling at me right now because these are like sort of semi-basic choices but they're like popular with people who don't even love board games so we're not asking best they're at your personal favorite so there's no wrong answers hell yeah thank you also i would be like uh guess who like <laughs> <I don't... laughs> yeah oh, this like, all sounds like gibberish to anyone who's like why would i play a board game as an adult <laughs> <laughs> What was your favorite childhood cartoon or kid series if it's a live action? Favorite childhood cartoon. I was just listening to something about Space Jam today, and I really love Space Jam. Even though that's, oh, yeah. Does that count as a cartoon? I'm not sure. I mean, it's a cartoon movie, but we'll we'll accept it because it's you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's dog crap, but we'll accept it. <laughs> Excuse it's, you. Okay. I'm a little older. I'm. It's the hook rationale. Like if you're of a certain age, people think Hook's a good movie too. But if you're old like me, you, you realize it's not. That's what Space Jam is to a whole generation behind me. I learned. Uh, yeah, I worship at the altar of Space Jam. However, revisiting it as an adult, I'm like, oh, I could not watch this. You can tell objectively it is not good. It is a commercial. It's like a very long form commercial. Sorry, Kelsey. Yeah. So it's, I think that's going to be my answer. If there were any, I was really into more like live action shows rather than cartoons. I think I was really into like um, Kiki's Delivery Service. I was really into all of the Studio Ghibli movies. But in terms of like TV shows, I loved um, That's a Raven was the best. Uh, That was like one thing. Um, I love that show. And that was a show that my brother would watch with me, which was like very, very rare that I could get my very cool, older, sporty brother to watch a Disney Channel show with me. So also that. I love that our choices are always influenced because I, too, have two older brothers. And it was like (laughs) whatever I could get them to sit down with me for because I thought they were so cool. Well, it was such a compromise. Like, if I did not have an older brother, perhaps I would have loved Lizzie McGuire. But because I had an older brother, it was that so Raven. And and who knows how much of that was was me and how much of it was having an older brother. Have you seen the cartoon Hey Arnold on Nickelodeon? Oh, heck yeah. I loved Hey Arnold. Oh, my God. That was my all-time favorite. And I have revisited it during quarantine. I think it's on Hulu. And? (laughs) It aged really well. Oh, did it? I thought you were going to say they were uh, opposite. No, it is. It deals with, like, some very progressive social issues. And I was like, what? Like, it is a lot of, like, talk about class on that show, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Socioeconomic class. Yeah. Just. I got to watch that. Please, so we can talk about it. I want to. I want to do a separate podcast where I just dissect. Honestly, please have me on. I would be so hyped. I'd be so hyped. Fucking sure. Um. Okay. This is the question that I have been waiting to ask you this entire episode with Baited Breath. Um. Who was your first celebrity crush? And I will judge you on it. Yeah. Um. I. (laughs) You're gonna judge harshly. Um. I think Aaron Carter would be the earliest one (laughs) but it manifested in a really weird way or not weird it manifested in a unique way because of the like 
was very much aligned with the concept of being a tomboy again was trying to impress my brother um so I like really wanted to be Aaron Carter when now looking back on it I was like that was me thinking it was really cute um but at the time I was like he's just cool like I like his style um so probably Aaron Carter but I, again I was like five maybe at the point so it didn't really manifest as I like I have to have you I just want to smooch you um yeah. the first person I wanted to smooch maybe Michael Sarah because of Juno which Ooh. again that's like, like such an interest uh, so many of my friends are like oh it was very important to my my development as a sexual being just because it was like such a, a more realistic portrayal of a high school relationship but yeah I'm gonna stick with Aaron Carter my first love wow I mean I can't <laughs> judge you too harshly on that one Kelsey spill it since you're you're also a guest here technically I need your answer as well Okay, I'm going to go one step further. Um, it wasn't Aaron Carter, but it was Brian Luttrell from the Backstreet Boys. So it's like awesome. one step removed because awesome. Aaron Carter is Nick Carter's little brother. Who yeah. In. One step removed, one step down, arguably. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Conversation Excuse for later. Um, I need to know if you know what Aaron Carter has been up to because I do. <laughs> Uh, I have kept, what, what is it? I have kept, I know this. I read this BuzzFeed article. What, what was it? He has a lot of face tattoos right now. Yes. Um, he was threatening his brother's wife and his brother. And then he, now I think he is addicted to meth and recently started an OnlyFans page. I so no, <laughs> might subscribe. <laughs> Shit. If you subscribe, I will too. I just gotta know. I gotta know what's happening. Yeah, I would want to know too. I feel like there was something that was fun about him in the news a few years ago, so I'm bummed out that that's the update. I feel like he like did some fun celebrity appearance that was like reunited with Aaron Carter, but um, it's sad to sad to hear that he was threatening people. Yeah, I feel bad. Like child fame. I mean, pretty much the only person I feel like from that generation that handled it semi well was Hillary Duff, which was oh, Liz McGuire. Literally thinking in my head, if she doesn't say Hillary Duff, I'm going to bring up Hillary Duff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's the most normal from that time period. But like, how can you possibly be normal if you were on the Disney Channel at that age? You know, like how it just it's impossible. So Kudos to her. Yeah, thank God. Yeah, on the sliding scale, on the curve, they did, they came out all right, the, uh, the Huffs. Totally. The Duffs. Yeah. Sorry. The Huffs. <laughs> <Duffs>. The Duffs. <laughs> in honor of the substitute host here, who that question was sort of in the vein of what she might ask somebody to, uh, if you don't know, has a podcast of her own called Gawkward that we've pitched heavily, I think, throughout the show and we'll continue to do. We must ask, Zoe, do you have a middle school or high school embarrassing story that stands out in your mind <laughs> when was i not embarrassed in middle school or high school um god i really i wish i could this is an audio format i wish this was a visual format so i could show you guys a picture of what i look like in the eighth grade i had <laughs> yeah. i had like very bone straight hair from you know a kindergarten to the sixth grade and then as soon as i got to middle school my hair like puffed out Without me doing anything to it, it just happened. And I had bangs. So I had like puffy 80s bangs in 2009, like not an appropriate time to have that haircut. And I look back on pictures of that now and I'm like, I asked my mom once, I was like, why did you let me have that haircut? And literally this woman said to me, I don't know, it was funny. Can you believe that? My own mother. <laughs> oh my God evil i think she would not say that at the time at the time she'd be like well it's you it's cute you're like kind of a, a cute weirdo um but at this point we can look at pictures of that and be like boy they yikes at that hair goodness yeah same here i had the hair situation going on so yeah. i feel you girl yeah and we could really get i could like we could get into it but again that's an, that's another podcast a specific podcast called gawkward that you should listen to Oh my God, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so what would an ideal night out for you in Austin be pre or post pandemic? We can't count this year. <laughs> like where would you take someone if they were visiting town for one night? Ooh, gosh. I'm going to do this as if the person visiting town was me and I was also the person showing them around because sometimes I feel like the place I would want to be is not the place I would take someone who's visiting for one night. 
Um, I love, this is not a, again, you were saying like, don't worry about being cool. Trust me, I'm not. Um, I feel like my favorite place to go in Austin is book people. And I love to just like get a nice coffee drink and walk around and, and loiter in, in there and read books and sometimes buy them and sometimes read them and put them back on the shelf. And they allow that there, which is very wonderful. And I am missing so dreadfully in quarantine. Like that's the place I go. Like if I get in a fight with someone and need to calm down, I go to book people. If I'm like have a great time and need to celebrate by buying something, I go buy a book at book people. So it's been, it's been a hard time for me. So it's not really a night out on the town, but uh, that's that's where I would go. Or the Blue Starlight Drive-In Movie Theater. I've had, mm, uh, if I say many a date, it sounds like I'm, you know, the belle of the ball, but a, a couple of wonderful evenings there. That is a good choice and pandemic friendly. Absolutely. That. And they're doing it very well. They're very um, COVID respectful there. So it, go yes. for it. They also just opened up a second location downtown, which I have not been to yet, but I'm very excited to go to. Ooh. I'm I need you to check that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, Sean. The the question was actually initially what what's like your movie theater of choice in town? Because there's many great options, but that she she found a way to answer it either way. <laughs> a little bit of both. So, quick question before the question: Are you a vegetarian or no? I am not. Well, then I have the question for you, also Austin based. Please. Uh, what is who, in your opinion, has the best slash your favorite barbecue in town? Ooh, controversial opinion, but uh. Black's barbecue is my go-to. I also really like Style Switch. Both of those very tasty. Um, I really love a like a lean brisket sandwich with a very with tasty pickles on the side. So you gotta have like a nice house pickle. <laughs> and uh and both those places really deliver. So those are my choices. Now when you say black's in town or do you mean the Lockhart location? Because there is Terry Black's in town. I'm talking about the barbecue place that's like right across from Leedsville. Uh, oh, awesome. there's a Black's, Black's barbecue. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. I, when you said Black's, I assumed you meant Terry Black's, which is over okay. off of, well, yeah. It's that's the same point. family, actually. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I forgot but, that Black's also has a Black's barbecue in town. That's my, yeah. that's my fault. No, that's fine. From what I hear, it's a rival family situation. I've heard the same. Yeah, that's what I was pointing to as like, this is potentially controversial, um, but I love a good family feud and I love good barbecue. So it works for me. <laughs> I love a good family feud. Uh, <laughs> those are very solid barbecue choices. And I challenge you to try Valentina's Tex-Mex barbecue because they are also delightful. Is that far south taco truck? Yes, it is. I have had that. It is quite delicious. Quite delicious. Yeah. Oh, my great. God. They have something called the real deal. Holy field. And it's just like, eat that and then go into a coma. And it's a fantastic day. Is that their like main barbecue taco? Yes. Yeah. I think that's what I got. And I'm pretty sure that I also entered a coma. Um, but it was delicious. It was a great one. It was a good coma. Yeah. Good dreams. <laughs> Do you still call it a food baby? Because my wife and I still say that from Juno 13 Absolutely. years later. Full food baby. Oh, yeah. Probably just oh, a yeah. food baby. Ooh, what is your go-to karaoke song? Oh, I um can't and I won't. <laughs> However, <laughs> we get that answer more than not. Actually, none. I hate it. <laughs> I I wish I could, and if I did, I would. One time I heard, oh God, what is that song? Is it called "If It Makes You Happy"? Very early, oh, June, maybe. The- Cheryl Crow. Cheryl yeah, Crow. I heard somebody do that song karaoke, and it got the place jumping. It was great. I like wish I had the energy to do a Cheryl Crow song, um, but I, I certainly don't. So if I could, I would. I think I would rock some Cheryl Crow. Ooh, yeah, I love an, an early two thousands like all the songs that you never play, but then you're in Walgreens one day and you're like, oh yeah, this this gal. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, Jewel she, comes she, on. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know, like those, like kind of happy, like oh, I remember when I was on a school bus listening to this. I love that stuff. Yeah, Sean, do you do karaoke? I want to know why this is on this list. <laughs> uh, that was a Becky question when we were coming up with different questions. But my answer, I, I'm not, I don't do it commonly either. But when I do, it's uh, Born to Run or Dancing in the Dark by Bruce Springsteen. Oh, that's awesome. I've also drunkenly belted out I'm Just a Girl by No Doubt before. Awesome. 
Um, I'm trying to think of uh, if I have another that would be considered a go-to, but I, I do it too infrequently to have a, a go-to. If I was absolutely forced to immediately, I, I, I couldn't pull off Cheryl Crow and I think I would go bowling for soup because I think it's like not a ton of vocal range. Easy win. Oh, yeah. The pop punk guys, most of them aren't even good vocalists. I mean, exactly. <laughs> mostly just talking through. What would you do? 1985? Is that what you're thinking? 1985. Um, if more people knew Ohio come back to Texas, that would be uh, an easy choice for me because I know every single word of that song. Yeah, maybe I'll I'll do some karaoke after COVID, you know, allows us to do karaoke and I'll get back to you. Almost done here. Next to last one, speaking of music, what would be Zoe Graham's walk-up music? Like if you were coming in for your TED Talk or if you were a boxer or a fighter or a ball player, what's your walk-up music? <laughs> Sorry. Have you guys <laughs> There's a um a recorder cover of the but it's the Fox fanfare. Yeah, but it's messed up and it's somebody playing it on a recorder. I, I wish again, I wish that I had the rights to this so I could just play it right now for you. If it's possible to splice it in, please do. There's also an amazing harmonica Jurassic Park one, if you haven't seen that or that. <laughs> that sounds right up my alley. Oh, that's a fantastic answer. <laughs> Thank, you so much. Thank you. You really you can't, you can't get it unless you've heard it, but once you've heard it, you can't unhear it. <laughs> I just want to see you as a WWE wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had a margarita before this. <laughs> I agree. I feel as I'm high. Oh, man. Um, okay, cool. Last rapid fire. Uh, what is the very first thing that you will do that you have not been able to do since the pandemic when social distancing is done? God, I have so many things that I can't decide which one I want to do. I'm excited to get a haircut. I really am. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also, like I said before, really been missing book shopping. Although, you know, done a little bit of less fun book shopping in other locations slash online. Um, well, I, I moved in with my boyfriend right before COVID happened. So we, we were like so excited to go on road trips together. And that's kind of been like, we could still do it, but we'd have to like get takeout everywhere. And if you can't go visit a city's restaurants, why, why go on a road trip? So that's my answer is that I'm really excited to go on a road trip. Oh, fun. Where would the first place that you would go? Mm -hmm. We, he's the worst in that he's already been everywhere and I've been nowhere. But he has not been to the Carolinas, so that's a spot that we want to go to. Ooh. Yeah, it's beautiful in, uh, I think it's North Carolina is where Jeff has shot before. I'm like, oh, yeah. I forgot that, that both of our uh, our pals are Jeff. We got double Oh, your, your dude's name is Jeff. That's right. Yes. <laughs> we should get them together. <laughs> they have so much in common. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure I'll run into you at the roller rink after all of this is over. Oh my god, yeah, I forgot that that happened. I oh, I should have said go into the darn roller rink, but that that too. I've been brushing up on my rollerblading skills during all of this, so I look forward to being able to slightly keep up with you. Awesome, awesome. I've been seeing everyone like buy roller skates or blades during quarantine, and then like far surpass the. I've been roller skating for like maybe three years. And these people get skates one month and the next month they're like, they have a skate Instagram and they're like doing like backflips on their skates. And I'm like, how is this what COVID does to people? It like makes you supercharged at all of your hobbies. All I can do is go forwards. Um, so, you know, let's, let's get together and go forwards. I agree. I will. It's a date. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Now, when you say you've been skating for three years, you mean old school roller skates or rollerblading? And is it just a exercise hobby or are you trying out for the roller derby? Old school roller skating, I'm not uh, aggressive. I, I mean, I'm sure it's buried down there somewhere, but I'm not openly aggressive enough to do roller derby. 
unfortunately. I'd be so into it. I again like the whole thing about loving being on in a girl band. Like the obvious next step is like go join roller derby. You could be on a team of like really cool women. Um but I I'd take one elbow to the face and be done. I'd be out. But then you could talk to Ellen Page about Whip It when you guys hang out on your movie set together. That's so true. <laughs> I really need to be thinking more about that. Things that yeah. we could have in common. Great callback. <laughs> <laughs> So that is the end of the uh, rapid fire. We appreciate all those answers. There's some all timer gems in there already. <laughs> Mention in the Tooch, Mention in the uh, Spy Kids too for crying out loud. <laughs> so Zoe, what uh, is there anything you have coming up or anything you can uh, promote beyond Set Advocate you want to share with folks? That's really what I'm I'm up to these days. I'm I'm also this isn't necessarily something that I'm like uh, promoting <laughs> in a in a professional way, but I'm uh, doing a a book club that sometimes I advertise on my Instagram, which is Zoe I Graham, where I read books that I like wouldn't be able to get through unless I had a group of people that w- was hold- holding me accountable. Um, and anyone is welcome to come be part of that. I, I post about it on my story. Now, when you say books you're, you wouldn't normally do, does that mean you go out of your comfort zone of genre or you take um, recommendations from people? I'm about to make this sound like the least fun book club in the entire world. Um, but it's books that, you know, the book that we're, um, this week we're finishing a book called The Body Keeps the Score that's about, uh, the ways that trauma, um, affects people's health and, and adult lives. So again, I love that book. <laughs> that's, that's a worthwhile read though for a lot of people. I, you were making it sound like you were going to say something that was just so mundane. Like I'm reading Bridges of Madison County because it's a group of 70 year old women and me. <laughs> No, no, uh, not unfun in that it's it's a challenging read. Um, I got you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to digest alone, and I think next up is going to be something a little bit lighter. I think we're going to read pleasure activism. Yeah. I love the book body keep score uh i read that i think my therapist recommended it like a year ago yeah that's i mean that's a tough ass therapist to be like you can handle this it'll be it's that's a hard book to get through now yeah yeah totally but i mean it's just so fascinating the way that your brain connects things and sorry i won't go off on a tangent i just yeah <laughs> i love i love that book <laughs> it, it's an amazing book and, and really has um opened my eyes to a lot of different people in my life and things that now, you know, I think it's hard to read that book and not have some other things click into place. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. A dark one to a very fun podcast, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> Let's see. How do we lighten it up? I'm still hung up on Brian Luttrell, but we'll talk about that, Kelsey and I, uh, later on. Jeff no one's ever answered that. Ever. About it, but okay. I know everybody loved AJ or Nick, but I'm here to tell you, I saw them in concert a couple years ago. Brian aged the best. And I touched his hand. I will give you that. He and looks the exact face. same. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, God, I love BSB. And then you mentioned your Instagram and your Twitter and stuff like that. We will put that along with setadvocate.com in the show notes at paperstreetpodcast.com so folks can find you there. Uh, Zoe, this has been such a pleasure. We appreciate the time. And uh, thank you for being on. Thanks for answering everything honestly and hilariously in some cases. This has been so much fun. It's like hanging out with two pals. And uh, during quarantine, I'll, I'll take any fun pal time I can get. So thank you so much. Well, like I said, the pleasure's ours. Yes, this was a blast and definitely a much needed reprieve from the current state of the world. All right. She is Zoe Graham. Again, thank you for the time, Zoe, and uh, take care. Thanks, guys.